morning. Thank you, Eddie, for welcoming us. Thanks, CBC and others, for hosting us. It's a uh, privilege to be able to share a few thoughts here with you today. I'm going to offer a, a, few, a few brief comments um, to just sort of frame what I have to say uh, this morning. But first, um, express my gratitude, uh, deep respect to Eddie and Brander, both for engaging us in this dialogue, welcoming us to this place. Um, we really need, I think, elders uh, like Eddie to guide us into some of the challenges that we're facing ahead of us. Uh, human lives that have borne witness to the effects that our cultures had on creation, on people, uh, and whose stories and wisdom could narrate for us a different way of being together. So I'm, I'm really honored, and I want to honor you both for, for joining this. Second, if it's not entirely obvious, I stand before you as a white settler, a white, male, heterosexual, educated, Christian settler, coming from a working class family, but nonetheless very much the product of social privilege. And I think it's important to sort of name that privilege uh, to allow myself to be unsettled uh, by the history of that. Um, we'll hopefully have time to talk about that a little bit together. Because uh, I think there's a fine line for us settler folk to walk between disavowing ourselves of that privilege in order to make room for the other, uh, and at times to lay claim to some of that privilege in a different sort of effort to make room for the other. And that's a dance that we could explore and discuss a bit more together. And I really hope, one of my deep hopes, uh, particularly for the CBC students that are here um, this morning, is that this could be uh, a time when you perhaps begin to <clears throat> confront that privilege in yourselves. The third thing I would just say before diving in is I, I speak and write and live as one firmly rooted in the Christian faith tradition. And as such, I'm aware that Christianity has not generally been known for its embrace or care of the earth. Uh, quite the opposite. And I, I say this by way of confession. Uh, I confess on myself, and in fact, the tradition that this, I believe, is a sin of omission, that we've not rightly cared for, for creation. And I use that language intentionally. Um, I think, theologically speaking, we are committed, we have committed and we are committing great sins against Mother Earth and many of her inhabitants. Uh, and too often, those who claim to follow Jesus have not lived in ways that care for creation and have thought that this way was somehow God-ordained. But I hope we'll see a different kind of way uh, emerge in what I have to share. I believe, uh, by and large, Christianity in North America has come to believe and profess what Peter Harris, who's the founder of Arasha International, the organization I work with, calls the genetically modified gospel. This is the gospel, the good news of life in Jesus that's been genetically modified and wedded to the aspirations and lifestyles of industrial civilization. And as such, it's the heir of a colonizing force which has displaced countless peoples and puts creation in peril. Too often, as we know, the church has rode shotgun, if not indeed taken the wheel to the project of modernity and continues to live then with blood on its hands as the vestiges of colonization, resource extraction, and historic injustice regarding race, gender, and indeed sexual orientation still shape and disturb its public witness. And for that, I think we must confess. Yet while I say that the gospel has largely been genetically modified, nonetheless, I confess allegiance to the way of Jesus that I believe could be a more earthwise and neighbor-loving path. And that is the vision that animates my ongoing work with churches, with various Christian communities, my work with Arasha, and I have the privilege of teaching here uh, a few courses at C here at CBC and elsewhere. I think we need to come together across traditions uh, to articulate a vision for the common good in the face of the global emergency that is now stalking us. And that rather than seeking to marginalize or homogenize the particularities of our traditions, practices or beliefs, 
we should seek to articulate and embody from within those very traditions a new way of living on Mother Earth. Traditions, according to Alistair McIntyre, have their own kind of uh, practical rationality that needs to be respected if we're to move forward. McIntyre, who's a Catholic philosopher, writes this. He says, I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories am I a part? I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories am I a part? And being part of a spiritual tradition involves living inside of a particular story or set of stories. How do we narrate the world together? Does one's life consist in anything more than the abundance of possessions? A question Jesus once posed, for which I suspect we all agree contemporary society has very little wisdom to offer us. And can we give an account of human embodied life rooted in a place, faithful to our traditions and beliefs, fulfilled in relationships with one another, and deeply committed to the common good of all? That vision captivates me as a Christian, indeed as a human, and the spirit of that drives much of what I share today. So the first question to ask, seeking a biblical perspective, is can Christianity honestly claim to offer any constructive guidance regarding creation for us today? That's a question that's sort of been dwelling uh, ever since this historic uh, publication of a sh very short little essay by Lynn White Jr. that my students that are here read painfully together uh, in 1967, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. And the recurring answer to that question, by and large, has been a resounding no. It really is amazing how influential these five pages from the journal Science in the late 60s have been and remain to be in guiding what many assume to be the definitive Christian or perhaps even biblical perspective on creation. And I think that's because many of his arguments struck a chord. So much so that this little essay has been reprinted over 200 times and led to literally dozens of responses varying from articles to full book length treatments. A little five page argument about the role of Christianity in the ecological crisis. White's argument was simple really and I'm gonna repeat some of it briefly here at least to provide a kind of frame, a way of framing some of the more salient issues I think we have to discuss. Christianity bears a huge burden of guilt, White wrote, because Christianity provided the spiritual foundations or the worldview which gave birth to the earth destructive alliance of science, technology, and indeed democracy. The religious cosmology of Christianity in the late medieval period led to the birth of modern science and promoted or perhaps even founded the instrumental view of nature. What's more, White argues, the Genesis creation accounts clearly separate humanity from creation to lord over it, thus rendering Christianity in White's account, quote, the, mo the most anthropocentric religion the world has ever seen. At the heart of his essay, White laid out a pretty simple argument, which is, quote, that what people do about their ecology depends on what they think about themselves in relation to the things around them. What people do about their ecology depends on what they think about themselves in relation to things around them. This I suspect we'd all kind of agree with. It may be just another way of framing that quote from McIntyre that what we do is the result of the stories that we believe. But such a notion is philosophically at least idealist. And by that I mean it believes human action is the result of worldview or thought. Um, idealists believe reality is mentally constructed. And many of White's critics have simply accepted those terms as by and large true and argued with him from there. So White argues that humanity's role in Genesis is to dominate or rule over creation. Many of his critics, particularly from the theological sphere, simply debate him on what the Genesis accounts actually say, et cetera, et cetera. The conflict here between two competing visions of how we construct reality, but it's still the thoughts, the beliefs, the worldviews that are primary in that construction. But White also has critics who argue fundamentally with the terms as he sets them forth. And this line of critique stems from a more realist or even a pragmatist point of view. These folks would assert that environmental action is not the product of our thoughts or beliefs, but rather that our beliefs and our thoughts are the product of our action, of our concrete social location. So we must ask, had White shown that religion was a cause of technological development? or simply that 
technological development that was taking place perhaps for economic and political reasons was being framed in Christian terms. We might argue it was not so much that late medieval philosophers began to adopt a new technology because they believed something in Genesis about the human role in creation. The opposite is the fact that the new technological developments of the late medieval period reshaped the human relationship to creation and thus led these Bible-believing folks to return to their texts and read them in light of these concrete developments. Does that make sense? Which way does it go? One way of framing that conflict might be to say, does our worldview shape our life in the world? Or does our life in the world shape our worldview? Truth be told, I think there's a dialectic at work here. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a both end. And you could press me on that. That's a cop out. I'll, I'll, we can argue about that. I, for one, am idealist enough to believe that stories matter, that they do have influence over our actions, including our actions toward Mother Earth. And thus, we need to attend very carefully to what narratives we abide by. Yet, I'm a pragmatist enough to recognize that what ails modern society today is not really how we read ancient texts, but the product of our concrete ways of life that are disrupting the life of creation. We're ruining the planet not because of what we believe is ultimately true, but what we were doing mostly unconsciously in our day-to-day -day life because it's just the way of life we've come to assume as normal. Much of that we're not aware of. Just think about how many of life's necessities you are involved in procuring for yourself, your water, your food, your shelter, the energy that it takes to, to, uh, to keep you and your home warm, or the waste removal when it leaves your house. By and large, if we come from any any ounce of wealth and privilege in the Western world, all of these things have been removed from our regular life experience. We simply have no idea how the, these necessities for our life come to us and sustain us. We're detached from them. I just learned recently that you and I require an average of 38,000 pounds of minerals to be mined annually to sustain our way of life. How much do you confront the extractive practices of those minerals when you pull out your iPhone to take a call, when you drive on a freshly laid concrete road, or install a new metal roof on your house? We're just our, our social location, or perhaps our, our dislocation from creation, from the poor and indeed one another, profoundly shapes our ability or inability, I think, to understand what our tradition might say to this topic. So the thing for us to do is not then simply to offer a new perspective or worldview though we, I think we must do that, but to issue a call for action. Our way of life is what must change. <clears throat> so to begin, I want to offer just a few brief reflect reflections in an attempt to remind us of how foreign and ancient life in the biblical world is, how different it is perhaps from yours and mine. The Hebrew Bible is entirely the product of an agrarian culture, one whose existence was dependent on early agriculture. Israel as a nation lived in much of its history under the shadow of the world's first great agricultural empires in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Though curiously its own agriculture took a rather different pattern because of its unique ge ecology and geography being in hill country in Palestine. Its identity as a people was born through a radical escape from Egypt, journey through the desert, and settlement in a land in Canaan. Its memory of an ancestral promise by God for a land of its own and a purpose, a cosmic purpose, is played out through centuries and indeed millennia of lived experience. Its sacred texts and practices confirmed, perhaps only fully, when the land itself is lost and with it its sense of cosmic purpose as it faces exile in Babylon in 597 BC. But the historical experience of this people in the Hebrew Bible is anchored practically in the life ways of creation, in ways that radically differ from your life and mine, living as we are several millennia later after the Industrial Revolution. It's worth noting that the first signs of environmental collapse were being experienced by these early peoples, though all of the ecological effects at this period of history were localized. Ancient deforestation of the Levant, chiefly in Lebanon, as cedars were clear-cut to build the empires of the ancient world, and the widespread erosion and salinization of topsoil as a result of early agricultural practices along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Mesopotamia. These are the two most well-known examples 
of how ancient peoples, the biblical peoples, interacted with the impact they were having on the web of creation. It should not surprise us then that some of their oldest stories reflect a deep under understanding and appreciation for their dependence on God for the gifts that sustain them. The chief of which for these agrarian peoples was one we all take for granted, which is water, rain. I'll have a drink of some. <clears throat> this dependence upon rain is reflected curiously, I think, in the, in the second creation narrative of Genesis 2. Here, as a Hebrew Bible scholar Ellen Davis notes, we find God to be the original farmer whose whole work of creating provides the appropriate and necessary conditions for crops to grow. Recall with me that in Genesis 1, before God creates, we have this pretty interesting description of the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The pre-creative state of the world before God's cre creative involvement is tohu vabohu, formless and void. And the creative Ruach Elohim hovers over the waters. Quite a beautiful picture, really, of a world waiting to be born, waiting to be created. Many commentators note here the image of creator spirit is one of mother hen, who's brooding over the egg which will become the world. When we move to Genesis 2, we find quite a different picture painted for us of the pre-creative state. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no one there to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. What's stunning to me about this text is that the two things listed that the earth is lacking prior to God's creative activity are rain and someone to work the ground. I mean, what kind of vision is this? What sort of person would describe the pre-creative world as simply lacking rain and someone to work the ground but a farmer? Ellen Davis again notes, this look back at the beginning is recognizably that of an Israelite whose social world was dominated and made possible by a mixed agricultural economy of rain-fed crops, those are the grains of the field, and small animal husbandry, sheep and goats pastured on the shrub of the field. This is Israel's concrete experience for much of its story, at least when it's in a position to be self-determinative of its own action. And no surprise to us then that this gets reflected back in how it narrates its life in the world together. What else could we say about creation in broad strokes in the Hebrew Bible? Well, a couple things I'll, I'll, I'll note. First, Psalm 25 <clears throat> states, the whole earth is the Lord's and everything in it. There is a deep and abiding sense in the Hebrew scriptures that we have been born into a world that is not ours. That basic philosophical problem, why is there something rather than nothing, is borne out for Israel as they wrestle with their own life and experience in the ancient world. This text comes from a psalm, and it's important to note that it's framed in doxology. The psalms, the kind of ancient hymns of the church, the people of faith, routinely reflect on human life in creation, celebrate its goodness and bounty, and direct their thanks and praise to God for this most basic gift. Psalm 19 then goes on in a different direction. The heavens declare the glories of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Creation as we know it and experience it, certainly as the ancient people experienced it, is vast and varied, cosmic and complex. Its creatures make their homes everywhere, in the waters, the trees, the soil underground, in the sea. Some daring critters, several billion of them in fact, actually make their homes right inside of our guts. Some of us have more billions than others. Um, for the folks who wrote this psalm, the whole thing, Heaven and earth tells of God's glory. The wonder that we experience on a starlit night stirs the human heart to offer thanks. This is a basic human experience. Uh, we direct that thanks back to our creator. And finally, the human ones have an interesting and particular role to play here on planet Earth. Recall that the Genesis 2 story orients the whole of creation around the rain and no one to work the ground, the fertile soil. Well, the story continues with the creator taking up from the ground, the Adamah, a scoop of soil, 
breathing into it to make the first man, Adam. Adam is made from the Adama and the spirit breath of God, the Ruach. And then we read the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. <clears throat> Thus the problem of there's no one to work the ground has been resolved and what of the rain? Well, right in verse 10, a river flowing, a river watering the garden flowed out of Eden. So the earthling is created to work and care for the garden. And much has been written about these verses in particular. I don't, I don't wish to rehearse that here. Just to note that this story reflects Israel's lived experience in the particular land, in the particular era of history that they were born into. This does pose, I think, a couple of problems for us modern readers. Because we come at these texts, by and large, not with agrarian eyes, but with perhaps consumer ones. Most of us no longer live in a world where life and creation is determined by the rain and our wise use of caring for the soil. And thus our distance from these texts is a problem, as is our distance from creation. Ched Myers gives a sort of similar analysis when he writes this. Three decades of biblical study have convinced me that it is not the Bible that hates nature, but rather it's the culture of modernity. But since that culture has shaped how we all read the Bible, I've experimented with a different assumption, namely that the perception that scripture is problematic regarding our contemporary environmental concerns has more to do with modern urban, non-earth literate readers than it does with the texts. Let me repeat that last part. The perception that scripture is problematic regarding our contemporary environmental concerns has more to do with modern, urban, non-earth literate readers than it does with the texts. Our very modern alienation from creation enables us, perhaps disables us, from reading these texts in ways that would offer a compelling response to the environmental crisis now before us. <clears throat> so what I want to attempt to do then is unlock some of those texts from within their own ancient agrarian context and see if that would perhaps give us a slightly different understanding of what the Bible may have to say. Walter Brueggemann notes in his classic text on the land that land is a central, if not the central theme of biblical faith. Yet by and large, whenever biblical scholarship directs its attention to issues of land, it's being concerned primarily with land, with possession of land as a territory. One of the great gifts of Ellen Davis's recent text I've already referenced, uh, it's called Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, an agrarian reading of the Bible. I highly commend it. <clears throat> is her view that in the Hebrew Bible, concern for care of the land is as essential to the narrative as is land tenure. The biblical writers themselves consistently regard the two matters as related, she writes. Land tenure is conditional upon proper use and care of land in community. And it's this concept of conditional tenure that's so thoroughly exercised throughout the Hebrew Bible that merits our consideration this morning. Much of the Hebrew Bible, for much of the Hebrew Bible, Israel's obedience to the ways of Yahweh are seen to ensure the flourishing of the land itself. <clears throat> they have what we might think of as an eco-groovy holistic faith. Torah commands a right ordering of the whole of their lives, including a number of particular instructions regarding the land itself. Not only that, but the people live within a kind of moral cosmology which assumes that their right or wrong action has immediate implications for the land itself. This moral cosmology, argues Michael Northcott in his recent text, A Political Theology of Climate Change, has been almost entirely discarded in modernity. Consider, for example, this text from Leviticus 26. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest, the grape harvest will continue until planting, and you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in the land. Safety in the land, abundant harvest, dependable rains, all of these are premised on Israel's commitment to follow the ways of Yahweh. The people believe that their right or wrong action has the ability to impact the cycles of rain and harvest. <clears throat> 
Northcott argues that this sounds foreign to modern Western readers, and our ability to make such a connection is at the core of our failure to respond to the issue of climate change. It's a very compelling text. I would, I would commend it to you as well. Understanding that human righteousness is the one condition that invites and makes possible God's continued presence in the land was assumed for the biblical writers. And so the Torah then goes on to uh, commit the people to certain ways of safeguarding the land itself with particular attention being paid to the poor and marginalized. Let me offer a couple of brief passages. Leviticus 19, for example, the people are commanded, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over a vineyard a second time or pick the grapes that have fallen, but leave them for the poor and the foreigner. For I am the Lord, your God. These gifts, these gleanings, are intended for all, not just for the owners of the land. Going back over the vineyard a second time would commodify that which in Hebrew law is given and entrusted for all. Essential to covenant obedience is keeping the Sabbath. And this has explicit implications for all creatures, not just for the covenant community. Six days you do your work, but on the seventh you do not work, so that your ox and donkey may rest, so that the slaves born of your household and the foreigners living among you may rest. Exodus 23, verse 12. Keeping the Sabbath is as much about rest for donkeys, for foreigners, for slaves, as it is for God's own people. The schedule which Israel keeps is a reflection of the schedule God kept in creation and is intended for all. And what's more, after six years, the land is given a Sabbath of sorts, a year when it's not planted, tended, or cultivated. And this is ancient wisdom, that we simply cannot work the soil perpetually without ruining it. And so traditional peoples, agrarian peoples the world over, have practices of routinely following their fields. Finally, after seven cycles of seven, they're commanded to practice the Jubilee, the Sabbath of Sabbaths when the debts are canceled, the land is given rest and returned to its original inhabitants, and all of those who've fallen into debt are redeemed. And the text that encapsulates this little piece of legislation, Leviticus 25 and 26, is a comprehensive text covering almost every aspect of what we think of as the economy. Land, labor, leisure, debt, interest, and capital. Yet it does so in a way that turns on its head much of what we now think of as economics. As T Timothy Gorringe says, these texts provide a practical hedge against the inevitability of wealth stratification and power within human society. For Israel, how they provide access to land and to the fruits of land was a central importance to their life of faith. This isn't an add-on to religion. Rather, it is the way in which religion is embodied in life in the world. This is how we live together. And what rationale is given for this radical program of land redistribution? Leviticus 25, 23, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine. You are its tenants. The land is the nahala of Yahweh. We are the tenants. The anchor to what we might come to think of as the Old Testament land ethic is then this understanding of conditional ownership. The land is owned ultimately by Yahweh. We as tenants must use it rightly. Such a program though, you probably feel this inside you, rubs up against many of the realities of life in the world, particularly a world in which land and the fruits that come from land have been mostly marketized. Here we find perhaps one of the more stunning facts about the biblical story that right in the Hebrew Bible, this conflict is witnessed. A conflict between understanding the land as nahala, as a sacred trust given by God, and seeing land as another commodity that could be bought, traded, sold, and indeed leveraged to produce greater personal wealth. And at the heart of that conflict is this stunning story of Naboth's vineyard in 1 Kings 21. I want to spend a good chunk of time on some of this story. This is, I should say, part of a broader conflict throughout Israel's life, which kingship itself seems to push them into. The old model of Israel as a tribal confederacy is eventually conceded toward a model of monarchy and kingship. And this creates an ongoing conflict within Israel's life. Naboth's vineyard is one such story where the conflict over land between the peasant Naboth, 
the landowner, and the Israelite king Ahab comes to a head. And the verdict on this conflict is delivered in the end by the prophet Elijah, who's said to be speaking for God. Let's hear a little bit of this story. First, what do we know about King Ahab and his time of rule over Israel? Well, in 1 Kings 16, we read, Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of our Lord more than any of those who were before him. He marries Jezebel, daughter of the king Ethbaal of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He set up an Asherah pole. He provoked the anger of the Lord more than all of the kings before him. Tim Gorringe argues that much of the history laid out for us in 1 and 2 Kings recounts a standoff between two cultures, two economies, and indeed two legitimating deities, Yahweh and Baal. And here with Ahab we have the Israelite king who's meant to follow Yahweh, to observe Torah, to enact justice, to ensure the right keeping of people's life in the land, has married Jezebel and bowed to the Baal. Thus, at the start of 1 Kings 18, the Lord sends Elijah, whose name means Yahweh is God, who meets with Ahab. There's a drought going on, and Elijah announces a little contest between himself and the prophets of Baal. This is a well-known story, probably to many of you. In the great scene in 1 Kings 18, Elijah challenges the Baal prophets to do what they claim to do best to provide fertility. Fill the supermarket shelves and when they ultimately fail, they are destroyed. What may be obvious, but merits our consideration, is that while Ahab, king over Israel, should be theoretically immersed in the narrative of his tradition and recognize fertile land, the gift of rain, comes from Yahweh alone, recall Genesis 2, in this instance, he is instead following the regular pattern of his neighbors, calling in whatever support he can to fix the problem. We need rain. And if Yahweh's not going to send that rain, we're going to get the 450 prophets of Baal to send us rain. Something's got to work. Interesting to note, instead of sending rain, immediately Yahweh sends Elijah. The rain does come, but we're not going to cover that part of the story. This conflict is, again, between two competing economic visions, one embodied in the cult of Baal, the other in the cult of Yahweh. According to the traditions of Baal, a name which means owner, the king is given absolute power. Whereas according to the traditions of Yahweh, the king was subjected to the ancient law of the tribes, a law which, as we've seen, grounded the distribution and use of land in faithful action in community. Ellen Davis agrees with Gorringe's interpretation. This, she said, is an emblematic tale of two economic systems, cultures and conflict, each with a different principle of land tenure. The ancestral household versus the expanding royal domain, symbolized by the fact that Ahab doesn't just live in a house, but a palace, a term the Hebrew Bible otherwise reserves for foreign kings. So King Ahab has a winter palace in Jezreel, and one day discovers that nearby, Naboth has a nice vineyard. We pick this up from 1 Kings 21. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it's close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you would prefer, I will pay you for whatever it is worth. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give to you the inheritance of my ancestors. So Ahab went home sullen and angry, because Naboth had refused and said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. He lay on his bed sulking, and refused to eat. The scene is set in the Jezreel Valley, which both then and still today is the richest agricultural region in the country, close to the major trade routes running through the Megiddo. He goes and he makes an offer, a good offer. He'll trade you land for it, or otherwise pay fair market price. The response from Naboth, though, is telling. It would be a defilement for me. The Hebrew is halela. It would defile me before Yahweh if I were to give my inheritance to you. <clears throat> it would be ritually unclean of me. It would violate my covenant relationship with God to do so, to give my nehala to you. Here we find a conflict which simply can't be reconciled. 
Naboth's refusal may seem unreasonable. On the surface, most of us have no problem with Ahab's offer. I mean, governments have the right to exercise eminent domain. The king makes a fair offer, pretty generous, an equal exchange, land or money. But the only line Naboth speaks in the story notes that his objection is theological on the basis of impurity. It would defile me. To sell or trade his beloved land would defile him. As Ched Myers argues rightly, I believe, quote, to traditional peoples all over the world, Naboth's position makes perfect sense. The land is simply not for sale because it is not a commodity. It is nehela. This key term in the Hebrew Bible is poorly translated possession or inheritance, but rather it connotes a sense that the land is held as a gift from the creator. And its use is conditional not just on good stewardship, but on a deep and enduring covenant relationship across generations. We might say, as, as Myers does, that this passage could echo our First Nations brothers and sisters that the land does not belong to Naboth. Naboth belongs to the land. And it is because Naboth belongs to the land that it would defile him to sell it. Here in a few very short verses, we capture the essence of this conflict between these two ways of life. Fair market price was not the way that the land system was set up for the people of Israel, not in the beginning. It's not the market which determines the value of their land, although that did reflect ancient practice uh, round about them. But according to the old Yahweh's principles, each family had a share of Nehela, which guaranteed them a living and a freedom, a stake in the means of production. Recall the Jubilee laws of Leviticus 25. When the debt is forgiven and the land is returned, who, who is it returned to? To what? Well, it's returned according to the old traditions of Nehala, anchored in Torah, where Joshua distributes the land among the 12 tribes in Joshua 11. The Nehala thus might be better rendered the tribal ancestral lands, hardly a commodity that one could trade, buy, or sell in market terms. That King Ahab justifies his request by stating, let me buy your vineyard so I can plant myself a vegetable garden, suggests Ellen Davis one of two things. First, if the king is sincere in wanting to rip up a vineyard to plant a vegetable garden, he would be ignorant, self-indulgent, or stupid. Why, she says, raisin cakes, grape honey, and wine were staples of the Israelite diet. Vegetables were not. Indeed, there may be a negative judgment implied with respect to Ahab's mention of a vegetable garden, as the only other biblical occurrence of this phrase appears in Deuteronomy's statement that the promised land is not like the land of Egypt, where you would show your seed and water with, food, with your foot like a vegetable garden. Thus, Davis argues this echoes back to Egypt. King Ahab is trying to recreate the food economy of Egypt within the promised land something that I think the texts make abundantly clear just ain't supposed to happen. But second, and perhaps more importantly, it makes no sense ecologically. A vineyard is a long-term investment, a sign of permanence, an investment in the future of a place and a people. Ahab was a powerful military king who mounted successful campaigns against the kingdoms of Damascus and even, for a while, beat back the Assyrians. Ahab's wars were fought over the comparatively scarce arable land, the tradable goods it could produce, and control of trade routes. With that in mind, one might suspect that the proposed royal vegetable garden is simply a scam. The king has a large professional army to support, as well as a rather lavish lifestyle. In all likelihood, Ahab intends not to tear out the vines to put in vegetables, but rather to simply appropriate their yield and produce wine for his own table and for export. Our story does continue. <clears throat> Recall where we left off. Ahab is sulking because Naboth had refused him. Not a very kingly action, and there's a bit of a satirical element to this whole chapter. So his wife, in verse 5, his wife Jezebel came in, and, came in and asked him, why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered, because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another in its place. But he said, I will not give to you my vineyard. 
Jezebel, his wife, said, Is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you that vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal upon them, and sent them to the elders, the nobles that lived in the city with him. And in the letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting, and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him, and have them bring up charges that he has cursed both God and the king. Then take him out back and stone him to death. So the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth city did just as Jezebel directed in the letters she had written. They proclaimed a fast. They seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him and brought charges against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and king. And they took him out back of the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent a word to Jezebel. Naboth has been stoned to death. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, Get up, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite that he refused to sell to you. He's no longer alive, but dead. And when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. This episode illustrates just what the agrarian traditionalists were up against, a full-blown political coup, a conspiracy to take by force what couldn't otherwise be sold or traded. And this, I suspect for us, is an all too familiar story, particularly for us here in BC with our history of unceded territories and a growing conflict between wealthy elites seeking to marketize land in order to export profits and those who still live in the land and regard it as Nahala. I'll come back to that in a moment. In the biblical account, Naboth's refusal to sell is reiterated three times by his antagonists, perhaps incredulously. You mean you really would not let this simple pipeline come and pass through your territory? You'd refuse all of those economic benefits? All those jobs? Who can refuse such an offer? The Lord forbid it would defile me to marketize my ancestral lands. Jezebel emerges as a primary conspirator, while King Ahab is portrayed as a sulking little boy that doesn't get what he wants. And in verse 7, the queen rightly diagnoses that the standoff with Naboth represents a threat to his rule. This is about sovereignty. The, t the Hebrew, ta'asa maluka, can be translated, are you, exercising, are you exercising sovereignty or not? Are you really in control or not? After questioning her husband's ability to assert his sovereign kingship, Jezebel takes the matters into her, chance, her own hands, trumps up some false charges, blasphemy against God and king, and has Naboth killed in the streets. This conflict is not simply about a provincial dispute over eminent domain, but about a broader political struggle. Ahab wished to break the traditional pockets of resistance to his program. This may have been why he moved his winter palace right into the heart of the Jezreel Valley in the first place. It's a bit like putting Fort Langley right in the heart of Indian territory in the 19th century to secure foreign trade deals or building a US military base in the middle of tribal lands in Afghanistan today. But ultimately unable to bribe Naboth, Ahab is forced to eliminate him, and thus to break the power of local resistance. Reading the rest of the story, we discover that Ahab's alleged need for a vegetable garden was false. No wise monarch would uproot a productive vineyard for the sake of vegetables. So king, king, the king's initial request was utterly disrespectful, a slap in the face to Naboth, suggesting the vineyard operation, which took generations to cultivate on traditional lands, could be reduced to an annual garden for the king's pleasure. Ahab's real purpose, Ellen Davis writes, was to expropriate Naboth's vineyard and produce wine for his own table and for export. This is a story, I think, more than any other that speaks to our present condition. We face pressure on all sides as ruling political operatives, perhaps too much to name names here, knock on every door to sell that which cannot be bought or sold. The Nehela of British Columbia and indeed all of Canada is being commodified in an attempt to strengthen political influence over this region 
and indeed in the world through export of our own homespun commodities, the chief of which is oil. And the same political operatives are now pulling on all the legal and jurisdictional levers they can to achieve this process, even in the face of a rapidly growing resistance movement. They might not yet be stoning activists in the streets today for resisting such developments, but they are publicly shaming leaders who stand in the way. And what is the blasphemy that these contemporary detractors have committed? No longer blasphemy against God and country, as in Naboth's case, but now the charges being laid, as they are, against the two uh, Simon Fraser professors that stood up for love of the land they call home, the charges they face in court with Kinder Morgan is blasphemy of a higher order, blasphemy against the almighty dollar. Kinder Morgan is proclaiming the public protesters resisting its work on Burnaby Mountain cost the company $80 million a month as the project is delayed. Standing in the way of that sort of profit is blasphemy of the highest order. And so in response, rather than stone these people on the streets, they've taken them to court. Several of those who stood in the way of progress face multi-million dollar civil lawsuits that allege trespassing, assault, and intimidation of workers. The BC Supreme Court announced just yesterday of a formal injunction against five such protesters that comes into effect on Monday. A, for, a further warning shot fired over the bow, perhaps. Do not stand in the way of this. One of the SFU professors facing the injunction is Lynn Cornby, a microbiologist. She fears she may lose her home and retirement savings if she chooses to fight the legal action that Kinder Morgan has put on her. Nonetheless, she fights on. Here are some of the remarks that she gave yesterday to those gathered at the mountain. She says, what is the value of owning my home and having a retirement savings if our world is spiring into this negative space? If there's no freedom of speech in Canada, if we continue to accelerate climate change, if there's no intergenerational justice, if there's no global justice, what is the value of my home? The Lord forbid it would defile me to sell my Nahala. I submit that this woman knows deep inside of her bones in the experience of resisting something of the truth found in this biblical tale. So in the end, Elijah does turn up yet again and asks the all important question. Have you killed and taken possession? The king who sought to become a landowner at the cost of freedom in the life of his people encounters the prophet of Yahweh who claims to be the only sovereign one in the land, which he has entrusted to the people to protect its freedom against kingly usurpation. The king is not above the law, and thus he's charged by Elijah with theft and murder. Thus, Tim Gorringe concludes, the Naboth story is symbolically about what Baal, the gods of ownership, do. They come, kill, and take possession. And Elijah as the representative of Yahweh, the God of life, opposes them for this very reason. Killing and taking possession are the hallmarks, Gorin's rights of idolatry. Over time, the economics of Nehala would be stressed continually and come into conflict with the centralized land ownership of Israel's kingdom. The prophet Isaiah rails against the people who join house to house and field to field, the result of inequality exacerbated by predatory lending schemes in the 8th century. This is a sort of spiraling down which occurs when Israel's leaders engage in such practices, and the stability of their nation and the land which they've been entrusted with falters. The Hebrew prophets explicitly link Israel's exile from the land with their failure to follow God's ways there. Isaiah states, the land, the earth, lies polluted under its habit inhabitants. They have transgressed laws, violated statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Jeremiah witnessed the same cascading breakdown of relationships. This people, he writes, had a rebellious and defiant heart. They rebelled and gone their own way. They did not say to themselves, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives us the rains of autumn and spring showers in their turn, who brings us unfailingly fixed seasons of harvest. But your wrongdoing has upset nature's order and your sins have kept you from her kindly gifts. Have we failed to give proper reverence to our creator and to the intricate workings of his creation? And has our failure to do so led to the upsetting of nature's order? 
This is certainly Israel's story as narrated by these texts. And thus the prophetic witness to exile is seen as the consequence of human rebellion against the created order. Israel suffers such a shattering event in 597 BC when Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem and sent many of the Israelite elite into exile in Babylon. Now scattered, bereft of their land and place, Israel struggled to understand what it means to be a people living in a foreign land and what purpose God may have for them outside of their own land. And again, God sent a prophet to guide them, Jeremiah chapter 29, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters over in marriage that they too may have sons and daughters, increase in number, do not decrease there, and seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper. Here I, su I suggest Jeremiah makes clear that the work of caring for land extends far beyond the boundaries of the land they had called their own. This is not just a particular work for Israel in a particular place and time. This is basic human work, reminiscent of what Adam and Eve were called to do in the beginning. Inhabit the place you've been given. Tend to the garden and its good soil. Be fruitful and multiply and contribute to the flourishing of all those who reside there. Having failed to do this in their own place, Israel must relearn to do it in the land of their enemies. Working to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you is a daily practice that teaches Israel land use is more vital than land ownership. The health and well-being of any place is bound up with the health of all its creatures. And the human community plays an essential role in the flourishing of the whole creaturely community, whether that is in Israel, in exile, or in any of the various places now inhabited all over the world. The prospect of exile is one way, I think, of framing our present human predicament. We too have failed to recognize that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and we've too readily exploited the land and its inhabitants for our personal benefit. It lies polluted beneath us. We therefore need more than ever to recover the deep sense of our membership within and dependence upon creation and to put that into practice in concrete social and ecological action. This is precisely the reality with which we must engage our ongoing work of Christian discipleship. And this is what Ched Myers and a growing number of others have termed watershed discipleship. To allow our life of discipleship to be formed and informed by our life in the world by the concrete ecological locations we call home. And we start with our watersheds. Every land and landscape has a bounded shape, a structure, a watershed that situates natural and human communities within the surrounding bioregion. This ecological reality is very seldom mirrored in modern political boundary lines, yet is essential if we, as we consider how the church might embody a new way of living in creation. Watershed discipleship is one way of characterizing that task. The theologian Philip Sheldrake writes, theological reflections on place can no longer ignore that the world of concrete places is full of exiles, displaced peoples, diaspora communities, increasingly inflamed border disputes, and the violent struggle by indigenous people and cultural minorities to achieve liberation. Thus, the first step for Christians in that task is solidarity and embodying a way forward. To confess that we too have played the power games of King Ahab, we who are the heirs of privilege have often used that privilege in ways that sustain ourselves and fail to honor the creaturely community that ultimately sustains us. We must learn to listen before we speak, to join hands with whoever we can in whatever ways we can, to stand up to the King Ahabs of the world today, and to do so as bearing witness to our God who endeavors that the gifts and fruits of land be justly distributed for the benefit of all creatures. It's in putting our faith into practice, making the ideal real, that we bear witness to what God is doing in the world and to what it means to be a human being made in his image. So may we and the church together endeavor 
to become attuned to its life and creation, and so doing to attend more closely to the issues of land and justice that continue to confront us on all sides today. Thanks.